Good evening. Welcome to Money Matters. I'm Charlie Shields of Wells Fargo Advisors, LLC. My co-host tonight is Brian Cohut. And Brian is a CPA and a certified financial analyst with Wealth Management. Brian, good to see you. Good to see you again, Charlie. And our special guest tonight, Amy Anderson, who is also a CPA. And she is from Virtual CFO. It's going to be an interesting show. We always have some good information, so stick with us. Well, Brian, let's get started by talking about the nervousness that has been created over probably three decades. Right. 1987, we had a 22% crash in yeah. one day. In 2001, the internet bubble burst, eyeballs per click or whatever right. they call it, didn't yeah. work anymore. 2008, the banks almost went away. They had to bring in somebody to rescue them. And of course, the banks that did the good deed and rescued them are still paying all kinds of penalties for things they didn't do. Yep. You have flash crashes like we had three years ago. And we had another mini flash crash. Market goes down 1,000 points on a Monday, <laughs> climbs back 1,250 points by the end of the week. And people are saying, is this thing nuts? What's going on? And, and they're starting to be afraid to invest. So what do you tell your clients? Yeah, no, I mean, it's true. And, you know, most investors, right, you know, the baby boomers or whatever, have been through all those, right? So yeah. their perception is there's a crash around the corner. When's it coming, right? Yeah. And the news loves to play up to that. Um, you know, we always talk about, uh, you know, a phrase we say is stay in your seat, right? If we can have our clients have an allocation where they can stay in their seat, mm -hmm. the news shouldn't shake them out of it. Or yeah. Easier said than done, right? Don't so, just do something, stand there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, right. you know, and, you know, had anyone had some dry powder, every one of those events you mentioned were major buying opportunities, right? From sure. the rallies off of those. Sure. Uh, but most people were doing the opposite. Running, you know, running for cover, not deploying money into the market. Um, yeah, well, back in '87, I was an avid investor myself. I wasn't in the business yet, and there was a nuclear submarine that was working with me at Villanova University, and he had just gotten his bonus check, and he said, "Captain Shields, the market's down 350 points. I get, can't phone my broker. I wanted to do some buying." I said, "Take the rest of the day off." Go buy some st stocks at the close. I still get Christmas cards from that guy. You know? <laughs> I bet you do. <laughs> and you, when you get a 22% drop in one day, there's probably something good that's going to yeah, happen. Yeah, I would hope so, that, right? right? Exactly. So, so uh, right now, everybody feels like the USA, good old USA, is the place to invest their money. Right. And when that's been working for three or four years, and nobody wants to touch emerging markets, nobody wants to touch even the developed markets overseas. We had that horrible event happen in Paris recently, right. and I don't want to time the show. For our investors, they should be talking to their own financial advisor. Absolutely. We're not lawyers, and we aren't exercising our CPA skills right. when we're talking about the stock market, so they should get advice. But in general, you know, how do you feel about USA versus overseas? It's interesting. You know, we've started increasing our allocation. We've been pretty overweight to U.S., which I think the whole world is. We've increased our exposure to national mainly because of a couple things. Um, we're about to raise rates again. To your point, not the time to show, but you know, at some point, the U.S. is going to raise rates. The other central banks are just starting to lower their rates. Mm -hmm. From a valuation perspective, a dollar of earnings is cheaper overseas right now than it is in the U.S. So, and mainly because they haven't participated in this recovery for the most part. So, yeah, we think it's interesting. You know, and, and some of these companies overseas, they're as just as international as some of our companies, and yet because they're positioned as a headquarters overseas. They're knocked down more. So that seems to me it might be a smart place to do some shopping. I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think the investor gets confused with, hey, I'm getting a, who, you know, in reality, who cares where the good company is, the headquarters, right? Mm -hmm. It's a good company in the U.S., a good company in Germany, it's still a good company, right? Sure. But people get, oh, well, Germany's a mess or whatever, and they try to shy away from that. So, you know, long-term investing is if you can buy your earnings cheap, you have a pretty good investment on your hands. So. And sometimes you, you, you'll see, our clients will see these matrices that show what was the best place to invest right. and what was the worst. And when you generally see the block for the emerging markets at the very right. bottom or near the bottom for four or five straight years, it's probably not a bad time to think about allocating some money there, right? Yeah. I mean, if you follow that block through, then you find it at the top, right? Yeah. So it's usually at the top or the bottom, which yeah. is, I mean, that's the volatility people can't stand. But you're right. I mean, I think I've known you long enough. I believe you're a reversion to the mean person like I am is, yeah. you know, the top can't be always the top, and the bottom can't always be at the bottom. It doesn't work that way, right? So and we have to have cycle through. it doesn't have to be an through. emotional decision right. because if you're an asset allocator and you say, I want to generally have 10% in emerging markets and 12% in developed right. markets overseas, 
it's not an emotional decision at the end of the year to say, well, because they've underperformed, the numbers are below that, and I should bring them up to that level. That's why we love rebalancing, right? Because you don't you take the emotions out of it. Because rebalancing is really buying what went up to to you know you sell what went up to buy what went down. But it's systematic. Yeah. You don't say, well, should I hang it? Should I not? So. Sure. And a lot of people talk about that, but Ooh. then they're too nervous to do it, or right. they don't get around to it, or yep. whatever. And that's where it's good to get some help from a professional. They can take some of the emotion out of it and reassure you. And instead of being an individual investor who doesn't want to buy on a date when the market goes down a thousand points right. and then says, gee, I should have two weeks later. You yeah, know, I mean, so. most people, they want to buy when things are good, not bad, right? That's the psychology of it. And we'll all say, well, that's not buying low, <laughs> that's buying yeah. high, right? Yeah. So, yeah, sure. it's, I mean, it's hard to do, but that's why you do need a professional because hopefully that you know they, they're divorced from that you know, psychology of the, what the market's doing, what the news is telling you you should do. Sure. You know? Well, let's talk about interest rates for a minute. Uh, we're starting to see the shorter term rates creep higher, yep. but interesting, longer term rates, they inflate to quality or fear because of some events overseas with terrorism or whatever. And so you're starting to see a flatter yield curve. Yeah. Uh, if you get an inversion, if the short rates go up higher than the long rates, that's a sign of a recession. Do you see possibly a recession coming in the next year or two? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, mm -hmm. it worries me. You know, the man. I mean, commodities is probably in a recession. The manufacturing in the U.S. is not growing, right? So there's certainly parts that would indicate yes, we could. Yeah. The Fed could throw us into recession. Sure. Um, and I think Texas that's the fear. Texas might have a recession, right? Because uh, of oil prices. And yep. That sort yeah, of thing. absolutely. That you know, anyone oil-driven is probably having a recession. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it does worry me. How about you? I'm sure it worries yeah, you too. <laughs> yeah, so. it does. Uh, I watch that carefully. Um, my hunch is that once the Fed decides to make their first rate hike with the short-term rates, that uh, there'll be a little bit of creep on wages, mm -hmm. and that will start to move the longer rates up too. So, but I'm watching that. If I keep seeing the longer rates coming down. While the short rates are going up, that's going to concern me a right, lot. Right, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, well, of course, the, the biggest benefactor of a nice spread between short-term and long-term mm -hmm. rates is the banks. Right, yeah, they're dying for the rates to go up. Yeah, <laughs> so. and meanwhile, almost every presidential candidate I'm listening to is getting on the bandwagon that big banks are evil. Right. And, you know, we got to make sure that none of them are so big they can fail. Uh, on the other hand, I say to myself, uh, you have to have a lot of size to be able to really put some money out there to help a big organization to do the things they need to do and get the home loans out there right. and all that. So what's your take yeah, on Yeah, I mean, you know, they're, they're sending mixed messages. I mean, obviously, from a political standpoint, it plays to the consumer well, all these big banks that, you know, take all the money. But the reality is there's so much regulation on these banks that you can't even you can't stand to be small, right? So right. the big banks are taking the small ones because they just can't be competitive, right? So the government's created these big banks that they hate so much, mm -hmm. right? So and they're taking bigger and bigger market shares because the little banks can't keep doing can't the compete. paperwork. Yeah, so. it's too much regulation that they got bogged now with. All right, well, let's hope some people in Washington can figure that out sometime, at least in the next 15 or 16 months. You know, we could only hope. Okay, <laughs> so. okay well, uh, I, th I thought it was interesting. The CEO of one of the largest companies in America initially announced that he was going to be giving 99% of his wealth, or at least that's the way the headlines right, came out. Right. And then it turns out that this may indeed be a big tax dodge. Right, now, right. it's interesting to hear these wonderful people say, all of us should be paying a huge amount of tax, and we got to support our country. And then all of a sudden, we see them hiring a battery of lawyers and finding a way <laughs> to tuck away billions of dollars and pay less tax than the average American like you and I has to pay. What, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I think you're right. I think there's... Most people are tax motivated at the end of the day, and they're going to do what they can to reduce taxes, right? So the, this to me is, hey, it's it, it was great, and you know if if he's serious and does it, that's awesome. But I still think there's a tax motivation of, well, that just gives me more to do with my money if I pay less in taxes. Yeah, and um, Judge Learned Hand said that tax avoidance is perfectly legal, right? And that looks to me like what is being done in that particular well, case. Well, it's why the inversions are happening, right? I mean, sure. it's why pay taxes, why choose to pay taxes if you can legally not, right? So, so an inversion is where a company in the U.S. buys up a smaller company, but they let the company overseas be the 
one that's doing the acquiring and thereby avoid a lot of taxes. Yeah, exactly. The they push their earnings out of the U.S. As we all know, unfortunately, the U.S. has the highest tax rates for our corporations, so they pay less in taxes, right? Sure. So. Well, let's try to help uh, one of our viewers. Uh, Mark Thomas uh, from Marion says, is this a good time to invest in gold? What a tough question. Yeah, it is a good tough question. And, you know, I'm, I've never been a gold bug, so I always say no, but, you know, I'll give him a, a thoughtful answer. Um, you know, gold is really good. And, you know, it's been not doing well because, you know, um, inflation's low. But if you're fearful of inflation, gold's a good asset to have. Um, if you're fearful of a financial meltdown, gold's good to have. So most people think there's a spot in your portfolio for gold. With the way it's been beat up, maybe it's something to look at. If it's not in your portfolio, I think most people have been dumping it <laughs> because yeah. it keeps going down. Yeah. But that's probably the time to start looking at it. So. Right. I guess silver's come down from near 50 bucks down to 14 or something. Gold's come down from 1900 to 1100 or some mm -hmm. number in that range. And so for people that are really afraid of inflation coming back, I say, Put four or five percent of your money in precious metals and commodities, and hope you never make a nickel on it. Right. Because if you're not making anything there, the other ninety-five percent will do just fine. Exactly. And if that helps them sleep nights, fine. But I don't think uh, precious metals are an essential part of someone's right. portfolio. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. You know, it's a hard asset. We, you know, I think I sold this story before. I have a client that owns a silver refining company. That's always about ten million. In, I'm like, he's like, what am I going to make, bullets? Like, yeah. I don't know what I'd do with my gold sure. <laughs> or my silver. I'm like, I agree. All right, <laughs> so. well, thanks for that answer. Yeah. So uh, we're going to put some information up on the screen now. So if you want to send us in a question, you'll know how to do it. You can have your questions answered on Money Matters. Please go to our website, money-matterstv.com. On our homepage, click on the banner on the right that says, Send Us Your Questions. While you're on our website, you can find information about our hosts and guests, as well as show notes and links about this show and past shows. Money Matters is also available as a podcast on iTunes and Stitcher, so you can listen to Money Matters while you're on the go. That website address, again, is money, M-O-N-E-Y, dash matters, M-A-T-T-E-R-S, tv.com. Okay, let's get into a real interesting part of the show. Our special guest, Amy Anderson, who's a CPA. Her company is Virtual CFO. Thanks for being with us today. How are you doing, Amy? I'm great. Thank you so much, Charlie, for inviting me. It's our pleasure. Well, obviously, from the title of your company, we can tell this is about people needing CFOs. So why should a company have a CFO? Well, the, uh, the CFO is a necessary part of management business. Okay, as a small and medium-sized business owner, there are a lot of things that that business owner does. They make the product or they have the ideas and they manage a company. However, not all of them have the, ba the bailiwick to actually do all the financial transactions and know all the details as well. Mm -hmm. So that's where a CFO comes into play. A company needs a CFO that is separate from the business owner because that takes a lot of the emotional aspect out of it as well. A chief financial officer can look at the business and say objection of, objectionably yeah. um, how to make matters better for the company mm -hmm. and how to take a really hard look if things are going bad. So maybe a, um, a business owner doesn't want to tell himself that things aren't going very well and a CFO can walk in with numbers and maybe make that owner wake up faster. Yes, the, um, the emotions that comes from, that's my baby. Yeah. That's, but I grew that company. Mm -hmm. You know, that's hard. It's also hard for the chief uh, for the business owner sometimes to take that next step, which is necessary for a company. You know, when they become from a small to a medium-sized company, and they're able to, and the the owner maybe, but I don't want to. I'm I'm holding back sometimes, and the chief financial officer can help them take those actions that are necessary to take those next steps. Sure. Now, now one of the things I know you do is uh, you're a virtual CFO for companies. So what's a virtual CFO? Obviously, you're not on site every day. Um. Not on site every day. And what that does, it allows the company to not have a full-time staff. Mar larger companies, uh, Fortune 100 companies, will have full-time staff. In fact, they'll have not only a CFO, they'll also have a controller, an assistant controller, and the staff that's necessary. For the small and medium-sized businesses, they're not quite ready to have those full-time employees. So a virtual CFO is the company that comes in to help them on a day-to-day -day basis or more likely on a week-by-week -week basis. 
Uh, some of my clients, for example, I see on a quarterly basis. And by seeing them virtually, I mm -hmm. use Skype and other technology to be able to help them. I do want to correct one thing, by the way. The uh, name of the company is Anderson Productivity Solutions. Oh, okay. And, uh, however, what we are is a virtual CFO. Oh, okay, thanks for clarifying. Mm, that's that. quite Good. all right. Okay, well, uh, as I was researching for the interview here, uh, I was thinking about this TV show called The Profit. <laughs> and this guy writes a check <laughs> to get things started, but uh, he is in your face making things happen, and I guess there's a real skill to being the kind of CFO that doesn't totally offend the people you're working for uh, and, and try to get them to motivate it to do better and work together as a team. And this guy can be a little brutal sometimes, so... Uh, what do you think? Yes. Um, um, my company is actually more of a partner okay. with the company owner, okay? Mm -hmm. And by doing so, I also am able to work with the business owner and actually have the business owner understand in more layman's terms, mm -hmm. okay? And I'm not in your face, and I'm not, I'm also not pulling out a checkbook yeah. and writing it, right. okay? Um, I'm also helping companies that are still growing, Okay, they're not floundering, okay? The profit, for example, comes in and changes everything, fires everyone and moves on. I like to work with the people that are there. Rearranging the people may be necessary, mm -hmm. but in more likelihood it's actually taking a hard look at the numbers and moving forward. What, yeah. what, what mistakes do you see when you come into business that they, how they set up their business financially? Is there a common theme? Uh, there have been a couple of things. For example, one business owner that I worked with had huge numbers of receivables. They had $85,000 outside of, um, in receivables for a company making about 250000 mm -hmm. And that was just way too high. He had no money coming in, so he was really dealing with cash flow issues. Well, it turned out his prior bookkeeper had created the invoice and had never mailed them. Oh. So kind of hard for your clients to so, pay you when they don't even have the receivables. Yeah, yeah. So cash flow is the biggest issue that is a common threat. Okay, so, um, and that's one of the areas that from a business perspective, that if you've got your cash coming in the door and can improve that, and you can reduce your cash going out the door, that will improve your bottom line. So, uh, how often do you have to get involved in saying this particular person doesn't have the skills to be able to keep this company going and you need to make a change here, or do you uh, just leave that up to the owner of the business? If it's from a financial perspective, let's say they've got a bookkeeper, mm -hmm. but they don't have the CFO, and I'm brought in as the CFO, that bookkeeper may not have the skills because maybe they've been there for 20 years, yeah. but they don't have the technology skills. Mm -hmm. They have been able to automate because they didn't know what was going on. That's the other thing that I bring to the table, having a systems background. I look for how much automation can we do with the systems that are present. Um, also looking for the integration between various systems. So in that case, if the person doesn't have that skill set for technology, that may be an issue. And I do leave it up to the business owner. I may make the recommendation that they get trained further mm -hmm. or teach them directly, and then if they're not able to um, adjust, and most of the time they are, or we, the business owner might make a change. Do you help an owner identify excess inventories that aren't going to sell? Is there a way that your systems will pick up that sort of thing? Uh, we, help them to get the products that are going to sell and get rid of the stuff that's not for the tax breaks on it, that type of thing? I What I usually do is look at the systems that are necessary in order to do that, yes, and look at the okay. reporting and leave that, though, more up to them from a marketing perspective. I'm not a marketer. Right. Um, I try to keep to the financial transactions. However, I would identify the reports that are necessary for the business owner to say, what are my slow movers here? And more appropriately, what is the, um, uh, the profitability by item? and yeah. get the reports that are necessary. A lot of systems are available to have that information, mm -hmm. and a lot of the business owners don't necessarily know that much detail about the systems to do that. Okay. So for example, if you look at customer profitability, mm -hmm. that's a big yeah. one that are, you know, do they have somebody that they're spending all their time on and all their money on and trying to, you know, keep ha that one client happy and they're losing money at the end okay. result. Wow. Or you've got another client that's great to work with and they pay on time and there are no issues, then oh, let's keep going with that one. <laughs> yeah. so and, the get, and get more of them. And get more <laughs> of those so, type, exactly. Yeah, yeah, I did, uh, 
for one of my clients, I did a scattergraph that identified, for example, how easy that customer was and how far away it was. And then where, where the, were they with their receivables as well? Were they on time or did we have to pay fees mm -hmm. in order to get that back? And it was a very interesting analysis that was done because all of a sudden pointed out what customers, although these were over here were bigger in terms of dollars, yeah. to, you know, gross dollars, but over here these customers were actually better. Mm -hmm. And they provided, again, there was less expense being spent, they didn't have to travel all the time to that client. So it was an interesting way to analyze it and the, cus the uh, business owner was able to say, I need to send my salespeople out to those customers more. Sure. Yeah. Good. The, uh, you know, you probably set your clients up with a kind of a scorecard or key metrics. Do you find they don't have, they, they really don't, probably don't know what they should be looking at a lot of times, right? Yeah, actually so. the fact that you mentioned even metrics, most business owners don't even know to do that. Right. Yeah, because they're so busy day to day doing their business, you right. know, and being in their business rather than working on their business. And that's where, yes, yeah, setting up that scorecard for them is critical. So, you know, what is it that they need to be looking at? on a daily basis, you know? Do they need to be looking at daily sales? Mm -hmm. Maybe not daily, but maybe definitely weekly. Mm -hmm. They need to see what their cash is though on a daily basis, for example, right. if they're really strapped. Or maybe they only need to see it weekly or monthly. It all depends upon the volume of transactions that are going through. But looking at the top customers, the profitable customers, their, their inventory, what's moving, what's mm -hmm. not moving, and then also um, their daily sales turnover and their, um, their days receivable. You know, okay. What do they have in the over 90 days? Uh, do you have a large number of customers that when you start working with them, they don't really have an adequate budget and a way to compare the previous year with the present year and that type of thing? Absolutely. Uh -huh. Yeah, many clients, again, do not have a budget or don't, um, you know, they say, okay, well, I've got a number for my, my revenue, mm -hmm. but they don't take the budget down to the expense level as well. And then a lot of them say, well, that was my budget and that's no longer valid, so I don't even look at it anymore. So I suggest that they work with a forecast. Sure. So a forecast is where you look at what's actually happened and you take into consideration, you know, what's going to happen now that you're a couple of months into the year. A budget mm -hmm. is great to, for looking at and for setting end of year goals, uh, yeah. right? Yeah. And then looking at it as you go along and doing that comparison with, well, maybe a new customer came on board, maybe the... Um, a new competitor came on board. You know, Apple didn't expect the Samsung to come along with their watches and the, everything else. So you yeah. have to make those adjustments as you go along the year. I would think a lot of times your services can be paid for by the suggestions and the way you make people more organized. That's got to feel pretty good if you can show a client that they're actually saving money by paying you what they pay you. It, it's been very beneficial to be able to say to a client, um, yes, I just found you, you know, with that one, $85,000, <laughs> you know, that came in the door. <laughs> you know, and he said, uh, yeah, you just paid my bill. I found <laughs> another client where, um, believe it or not, she thought she had deposited checks and she put them into their system. And I went to reconcile the bank account. I said, I don't see those anywhere. She said, but I have those. I said, where? She said, right here. You know, she did the mobile deposit. And it happened. It mm -hmm. never happened. She actually mm -hmm. never deposited the checks. Oh my God. And so she's like, oh, I just paid you a fee right then and there. Yeah. So yeah, uh -huh. it does happen. So having those controls in place, it really shows the owner, you know, okay, that makes sense to do. Yes. Good. So, so, so we're fellow CPA, so I'll pick on this. So you know, a lot of small businesses think they have a bookkeeper and then they have the CPAs doing that they're kind of covered. What's the flaw with that? The flaw with that, and uh, thank you for asking, I actually do a talk to business owners about that as well, which is there's a big difference between your CPA at the end, which does taxes, and I, I don't do taxes. Right. I don't even do my own taxes, mm -hmm. because that's a specialty that you have to keep up to date with. And uh, most of the time, the tax accountant is going to be looking at the past. Right. You do want to, you know, if you've got a transaction, which is tax, um, we were talking before about uh, Mr. Zuckerberger, You've got to have somebody planning for you for the future as well. Mm -hmm. But they're not into the details. Mm -hmm. And they're not into where are we going in the future, you know, to that level of extent. Mr. Zuckerberger, yes, he's, yeah. he's got everything being planned mm -hmm. out. Yeah. But to the normal you and I, mm -hmm. you know, the tax person is only going to be looking at the past year. And the bookkeeper is going to do those transactional items. 
Meanwhile, what the CFO does is looks to the past for trends for analysis, but also tries to work forward to expand into the future. Well, let's talk about the future. When someone's forecasting, we've got a good new idea and they're going to bring it in. I would think a lot of people are probably too optimistic about the revenues and they're unrealistic about the real cost of the expenses. So I would think you'd help to keep them out of trouble when they're bringing in a new system, right? Correct. Yeah, it's um, an important thing to be able to have that, again, that objection, mm -hmm. uh, excuse me, objective yeah. process to be able to say, okay, yes, I know you you love your idea. Yeah. Let's give you a high, medium, and a low deal. Mm -hmm. Now, w what are those possibilities? Yeah. And the person might be, oh, well, I'm going to have sales of, you know, $3 million for this one product. I said, well, let's ratchet that down a little bit. Let's see, because in the past you had this and didn't quite make it to $3 million. Maybe it'll make it to one. That's yeah, great. I, I have a, a not-for-profit I work with. Every year they're for, forecasting $10 million in revenues to meet their $10 million expenses. And guess what? The expenses are there, yes. but the revenues aren't. Yeah. And about the third or fourth time that you start seeing this happen, you hope they'll get a message that they've got to make some cuts somewhere, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 So. Speed, I mean, do you, do you see business owners leaving money on the table? Are there opportunities for them to increase their revenue? Yes, there are. Um, there are a lot of different ways to do that. For example, getting your, uh, making sure especially from a service Cashing industry. Cashing your checks and sending your bills out, obviously. Uh, that would actually <laughs> help a lot, yes. <laughs> so. and, and then there's also a lot of service industries don't necessarily count the time that they're really spending on clients. Um, lawyers, for example, are billing on a quarterly, um, every quarter hour, every five right. minutes the type of thing. A lot of services, though, if you're in a marketing profession or you're a business coach or something like that, or even as a CFO, no, and if you're billing by the hour, you may be leaving some time on the table if you don't have the systems to record it properly. Mm -hmm. And so that's one area, uh, looking at that unbilled revenue is what uh, we call it in the financial world, uh, making sure that you do bill every dollar. Similarly, if you've got expenses that had been, um, you went on a trip for a client and you did not bill those expenses even though you said those were billable expenses, you might be eating that expense. You don't want to do that. If you've got an agreement that will have those expenses to be billable, make sure you get them billed. The other thing is, with the receivables, you may have a client who is not paying um, for whatever reason. Rather than waiting for them and waiting for them to pay, offer them a discount. Offer them a 2% discount to pay mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. They might take you up on it. As we were talking earlier, interest rates are low. Yeah. So 2% to get the money now, what's it going to cost you? Really nothing. Right. But you'll get the money in the door. Again, increase the cash flow coming in. Yep. Uh, to close it out, just t take a minute. If you had a person call you up today and they said, hey, we want to grow our business. we got this exciting new product. Just what are some of the overview items you would talk to them before they really start to grow that company in just a minute or so? Okay. Um, I'd ask them, okay, let's take a look at your portfolio of products that you've got now. Okay, how have they been doing in the past? Great, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, what is your cost to pr produce this product? I don't right. know. We'll okay, that <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> then we'll have to look at it. Yeah. And we'll have to do some analysis to say, okay, what is the, you know, do you have plastics in it? Okay, what's plastics gonna do? Do you have gold in it? You know, et cetera. Yeah. And come up with some analysis on that. And be able to work with them and put together some of those financials for them mm -hmm. and then project it out like you were saying. Okay, let's put it in that you're going to sell 5% of, or five of these. I did have a client recently who launched something on the internet and for the first time was using the Google ads. And we got into that a little bit and we had to say, okay, what are we going to do with it? Uh, how many hits are we going to have? What's the conversion rate? And everything else, we came up with a synopsis of where we were going to go with that. All right, good. Okay. So if someone wanted to get in touch with you, how would they? They would go to andersonps.com. That stands for Anderson Productivity Solutions. It's Anderson with two eight S's. It's a Swedish spelling. Mm -hmm. A-N-D-E-R-S-S-O-N-P-S.com. -S 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 and there's also a... Um, uh, a couple of things on the website. You can sign up for my newsletter, which talks about various ideas, and um, hopefully they'll come on board. Well, thanks for doing the show with us. We appreciate it. Thank Next you week, very much. Our pleasure. Next week, we're going to have Tom Aiken, Cedarwood Partners. He's a business consultant. We think it'll be a great show. We hope you'll join us. As far as we're concerned, your money matters.